So hi everyone, welcome to our first episode of our Career Spotlight. We are so excited to introduce our first guest. So Natalie, do you mind giving us a short introduction of who you are and what you do? Okay, not a problem. My name is Natalie Schroeder. I specialize in anthropological and public policy research. I'm currently a research manager at Friends of Event Center Incorporated, which works to connect veterans with local services in their areas and help improve their quality of life. Thank you. Um, so what inspired you to become an urban anthropologist slash uh, polit political analyst? My mom. Uh, my mom has always been a really helpful person. She, I remember one of the earliest memories I have of her, we were outside of a Target and there was this woman there with her son and she was yelling to somebody on the payphone. She was really frazzled and upset. And um, my mom came over and, you know, how can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? She said, oh, I got left here. I don't have a ride home. So we gave her a ride home and she just kept telling my mom she was an angel and her guardian angel. And I just knew I mean, I was so proud of my mom. I just knew I, I needed to devote my life to finding ways to help people. So definitely that kind of sparked my interest in learning more of um, what I could do to help other people and have any resources or knowledge that I have at my disposal, how I can utilize that to better my community. So what are some ways that you really rewarded your community? Like, was there a particular project that you founded? Yes. Well, uh, not necessarily found it, but there's a lot of great things um, that I've done <laughs> that I think have been really helpful to other people. One of the things was I did research for the Integrative Behavioral Health Research Institute in which we identified target populations in the state of Louisiana who could use a telemedicine intervention for hepatitis C. And so it was a great landscape for it. Louisiana had just uh, done this hep-free Louisiana project where they were trying to eliminate hepatitis C in their state by 2021. Uh, so it was a really great platform. And so we basically, under the commission of the Integrative Behavioral Health Research Institute, we went and saw how viable a telehealth or telemedicine project would be in rural areas, more specifically than anywhere else in Louisiana. And what we found was that in order for them to participate more fully in the program, they needed more, uh, greater broadband access. And so it helped the treatment by providing uh, prepaid phones that, on which they could access the service. So, I mean, that I know that that really was really helpful. It was a lot of fun to do. I got to meet a lot of great people in uh, the Department of Health in Louisiana and just wonderful people who genuinely care about improving the health of people in their state. So that was great. So what does a day um, in your job look like, especially during this pandemic? <laughs> A lot of Zoom meetings, actually, <laughs> just a lot of, uh, not as much face-to-face -face, um, interaction with people as I would like, which can, especially during re in research, uh, can increase respondent bias because you don't have that observation of seeing people in their lived environment because of, you know, uh, social distancing and everything else. It's not always viable to go into a community and see the lived experience, so you have to rely on interviews. And there can, you know, everyone has a, uh, we call it respondent bias, but everyone has a, a, a tendency to not tell you all the nitty gritty when, you know, especially they're getting to know you and they don't really, they're not really as forthcoming in interviews as when you get to go and spend actual time getting to know people and you see them on their daily lived experiences. So it kind of, it's been a challenge, but uh, we're working around it. We have a lot of people that are tirelessly working and we're hoping the, that we get these restrictions lifted soon so we can go and spend um, a lot more time being more active in communities in which we're researching, so. Yeah, that's super cool. And so what exactly did a day in a life look like before COVID? Like, did you spend a lot of time interviewing people face-to-face -face and stuff like that? Yes, definitely more FaceTime. Um, and then there was a lot of the a lot of the earlier work that I did, for example, studying uh, changes in landed identity for people experiencing in, in uh, well, let's just call them zones of, of transition. So that could either be refugees having to flee to a new country, or it would be um, people in a city experiencing gentrification. So the them having to leave be either because of uh, increased housing prices, prices, excuse me, prices, uh, increased housing, home prices, uh, and increasing increased uh, property taxes, or the fact that they're uh, having political instability or other kind of threats to their life or livelihood that caused them to have to come to a new place. What does it look for somebody like that? Because we all get really stuck in our identities, our landed identities, American, Californian. Um, it, 
it could go into the very micro level to where a part of a city can be a part of your identity. Uh, oh, we're from the east side or the south side. And, and I definitely see that a lot in, in where I'm from, California, is these, these identities, they mean a lot to uh, people and, and inform how they, who they are and the types of groups they can interact with versus can't if you get to the nitty gritty as far as, you know, um, different types of uh, gang violence and other things like that. It can really mean a lot where you're from. And so for people who have to go to a new place, what does that look like? And it's before it would be a lot more of going and, and, and going to these places and seeing how these people live, going to the zone of transition, seeing how they're living now that they've had to move out. Um, and what we you see a lot of the times is people clinging really strongly to their landed identities, regardless of if they don't actually live in those places anymore. Um, and even clinging to the places so far as, you know, staying homeless in an area because they like the area so much and they don't want to leave, even though they can't afford to live there anymore. And you can't see, you can't see that experience as much over an interview. So before it was a lot more going and actually living in some of these places. I lived in Venice Beach, California, for example, for several months when I was studying out there. I actually worked at a hostel and I got free room and board for working at the hostel. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and getting to really get to know the people out there, it's, it's a lot harder now. Yeah, that's super cool. And we noticed in your LinkedIn profile that you are also a political analyst and you work in uh, mental health. So we were just wondering, you know, what, what about political analysts, analytics and um, mental health interested you and how does that um, exactly tie into anthropology? How is it connected? Well, anthropology is uh, the study of people. Um, so it's the study of cultures, it's the study of life ways, things like that. And in order to make, and it's a uh, public policy. So in order to make a policy, for example, like AB 2246, which is a wonderful policy that California is one of the first states in the United States to adopt, and it's our suicide prevention policy. Um, and that's really great. So that's a, one way of how mental health and policy interact is you can create a policy that, and what this policy does is it encourages, it doesn't mandate, but it encourages schools to adopt suicide prevention policies and even kind of grades them. Um, so you can see which schools have the stronger prevention policies in place. But in order to know if that policy is going to actually work or be fruitful, you have to know about the people in the area in which you're implementing the policy. So for example, if there's a culture surrounded on distrust with authority figures or teachers, then setting the teachers as your the first step um, before, you know, the first step in, in, in suicide intervention may not be a great idea if they're not as comfortable talking to their teachers. Uh, luckily in California, it seems to be working really well. Teachers are actually the best first contact for a lot of students. So that's actually not the issue, but you really have to know about the people in order to make sure that the policy targeted at something like improving mental health provision in an area is actually gonna work. So knowing about people, anthropological study, knowing about their cultures and their histories and their, their social interactions with other groups of people is exceptionally important. Otherwise, you're going to have a failing policy, uh, like putting a freeway in a place where people are, have a, a large bike, biking culture like San Francisco, additional freeways may not be as helpful to the population and may just increase pollution and other things like that. And um, uh, disinvest communities from an area, for example, rather than increasing, you know, co uh, commuting times or improving commuting times because a lot of people are not utilizing cars as much. So knowing stuff like that is really important. Yeah, so based on that, do you work very closely with people in different careers, like in counseling and other stuff like that? Well, currently we work NOAVET, um, which is the public name of Friends of the Vets that are incorporated. We work a lot with uh, the vet centers in the area, which a lot of them are therapists and counselors that talk to veterans one-on-one -on -one and get the firsthand experience with that. So we're lucky enough to be partnering with them and getting a lot of that firsthand information. But yeah, it's, it's all about building relationships with different, different community partners, especially, you know, it's all about the project. So if you have a project in mind, you need to figure out who is going to be the most impactful person to speak to to get that project pushed forward and it's really about connecting other people and the most important thing is uh, I've always been told nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care so caring first showing that passion is really just the most important thing because you're selling not so much yourself but you're selling your heart your passion like this is what I believe in this is what I'm going to give 110 percent to and that's really motivating for not just you but any team members uh, that get on board with you. 
And then on that note of mental health and education, do you think that there's this broad like system of preparation that teachers can adopt in helping students with mental health? Um, like for instance, having a lesson, even in math classes where the, um, where the growth mindset is introduced to students or do you think it should be specific to each individual student? I definitely think that having programs or uh, introducing mental health in a general setting is positive in the sense that it familiarizes people with it. And one of the biggest things, uh, challenges that anyone working in mental health will face is the stigma. It's really hard to support people who are suffering from something that's, you know, largely invisible to everyone else and that not many people understand. And they think, you know, a lot of people tend to think mental health is a, is a choice. And sometimes, I mean, yes, the steps to take are, are very um are very important to actually start on that path to choose to to get the help that you need if you are suffering from a mental condition. But a lot of thing, a lot of times, people don't realize how incapacitating it can be to have a mental health condition, and getting help is not necessarily something you have the motivation or the energy to do. Um, and it's not you know, people don't wake up one morning and say, "I just uh, you know I'm deciding to have a mental illness or having some kind of struggle in my life that I can't overcome." So really destigmatizing that, I think it's really important to have it uh, more readily introduced in the classroom. But as far as a real intervention, it has to be idiosyncratic. It has to be tailored to an individual because people are all different. We have different backgrounds and tastes and triggers. And so, yeah, a, an intervention on a personal level has to be. Yeah, that's definitely really true. Um, in Miami, we're starting to incorporate that within teachers, even math classes, we learned about the growth mindset. So being able to see professionals like you guys, um, like mental health advocates, uh, Incorporating that, that's um, amazing. So thank you and any of your coworkers for any help. Um, so most of our audience consists of middle school, high school students, um, and a few that are transitioning into college. So if you could uh, tell us a little bit about what you did in college to go into this field, um, if there was a class you took that really sparked that love for community building and problem solving, um, that would be awesome. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I loved one of the first things that kind of got me interested in people was uh, my high school science class. We did the Punnett Square. And I'm sure, not sure if, if everyone's familiar yet, but the Punnett Square is basically it teaches you what kind of traits that you're likely to have based off of your parents' characteristics. And I thought that's fascinating. Oh my goodness. Little did I know that's anthropology. Uh, anthropology has different um, sects. So we have, there's archeology, span there's biological anthropology, there's linguistic anthropology, then there's cultural anthropology um, and primatology, which is a form of zoology, I believe, but it's really closely related. So you have all these different studies of, of the different things we do, our language, our culture, our evolution over time. Um, and I took, uh, you know, after I got into college, I took actually a Native American anthropology course because I was so fascinated in learning more about uh, a highly uh, you know, disinvested people that, I mean, I've just gone through so much and I wanted to know more about the, this culture that has been largely um, largely compromised in the United States. So, and that just really triggered me to care so much more about uh, how everybody thinks and, and believes and feels because it's really important to really know somebody before you can help them in any way. It's, it's like a stranger giving you advice that they know nothing about you. How can they, they give you anything meaningful? You know, again, nobody cares what you know until they know that you care. And so learning about people, they're, they're like, oh, you know about me, you know about my life, you know, and it, it's easier to make connections with uh, people then and, and, really, and really help. And then you know what they need. You know, if you don't know anything about uh, somebody, then you don't even know what they need and, and how can you help them then? So it's, uh, that class was really just amazing. Yeah, and um, if I'm correct, you do so, you did some work in urban anthropology. What made you choose that specialization, like specifically? Well, in my undergrad, I had an amazing professor. Her name was Sylvia Nam, Dr. Sylvia Nam, and she was an urban anthropologist. And so I began studying under her and she became my faculty sponsor for a thesis. I wrote on gentrification, which uh, talked a little bit more about those changing of identities that people ex experience in these zones of transition where they have to move to a new place. Um, and what really sparked me that is, is that a lot of 
major things are done in cities and and the built environment informs so much of our existence and what we do right the land that we live on we are so intrinsically tied to uh, and we often forget you know we often forget how meaningful our childhood home is to us or or different things like that even the city we grew up or or the different resources we had and and we forget how much that impacts our futures. You know, living where you grew up is going to impact what kind of school you go to, which is going to impact what kind of college you go to, which is going to impact which kind of career you're going to have. Um, so land where we live, it, place matters. Place is, is very important. It, place can determine what kind of nutrition you get, and and all this other stuff. So understanding how people work in these very different environments sometimes is really inspiring and also very informative of how we can improve the quality of life of areas that are not getting the same resources as others. So um, again, the, what really inspired me to do urban anthropology was this instructor who was amazing. And uh, if anyone's going to UCI, I recommend taking a class with her. She is fantastic. That was really very interesting. Uh, my parents are actually Native American. We're from the Mosquito tribe. Um, so being like seeing someone actually like being interested by any studies that are in accordance with us, that really warms my heart. So thank you for really talking about that. Um, so did you have any mentors in the field? I know you discussed about the professor, uh, but was there anyone else like maybe you had an internship at a museum that they really guided you throughout that thesis and research process? Well, I, I did talk a little bit about Professor Nam. So she was definitely one of those major guides. I've also had plenty of other professors. Uh, Professor David Frank, um, he was wonderful. Dr. Frank, he is um, a sociological professor that studies sexualities. And so that really brought you know, a, a whole new light and, and understanding to the LBGTQ community, who I'm very passionate about supporting. Um, and, and that was really, that, that informed me as a person very deeply. And I will always be grateful for that, for bringing me closer and helping me to understand uh, just, I, and I, again, just another facet of, of, of human beings and how we're all beautiful and different and unique. Um, and then there was also Professor Gorowski, Dr. Gorowski. And um, I, he is actually, I believe he specializes in Mesopotamia. Mesopotamian pottery, but he was an archaeological professor and and getting to do go on digs with him in Palomar Mountain over the weekends, you know, as I was doing my undergrad was, again, just gave me a passion for education for helping teach other people, uh, just seeing people who love what they do and who loved people and learning more about people and helping people and increasing knowledge, it, it really just inspires you to keep moving forward and, and guides you along the way. So definitely any advice I would have is seek out somebody who does something that is interesting to you, even if you don't really know what it is. And nine times out of 10, they're gonna be more than happy to teach you all about it and then some. So it's definitely just uh, putting yourself out there to make the connection to learn. Because like I said, most people are willing to teach. Yeah, so and just based off that, have you mentored others in your career? If so, like what has your experience been like? Yes, I've done some mentoring. Um, it's been it's been good and bad depending on the different circumstances. Now, there's this when you're mentoring an individual, there's this there's a twofold. Is it's one you don't want to overstep, so you don't want to basically micromanage uh, what they're learning. You basically want to provide them, not the map, you want to provide them the destination and have them figure out how they get there on their own. And it can be challenging at times if uh, somebody lacks the motivation. And so then you have to go back and find the tools to motivate. And, and, that, and that's always a great thing because when you actually can ignite someone's interest or spark their passion in something or spark their passion to find something they're passionate about. Because then you get uh, individuals who are like, you know, I'm, I'm not even motivated. I'm not even good at anything. I don't want to look for anything. Um, you know, uh, and then just looking, okay, well, what, what is it you like to do when you're at home? Oh, I like to play video games. And it's like, okay, well, have you ever thought about video game design? Do you like art? Um, these kinds of things. Or it's a video game tester. Are you good at finding bugs? And do you look for, you know, especially somebody who's more of a, 
of a problem oriented mindset, they're great at finding bugs with programs. And so having them look at to do something like that in, in their field is, you know, it's, it's really good to when you can put someone on a path and have them say, oh, you know what, I think that would be really good for me. And then you get, you know, letters down the road of people saying, hey, you know what, I'm really glad we work together because I found something that I love doing. Um, and that's always very rewarding. So with the advent um, of coronavirus and we see these stresses applied um, to systemic racism and everything, do you think that like any light has been shed, do you see an increase um, in interest in urban anthropology or have more people contacted you about these issues? It's definitely something that's being talked about a lot more. Um, as far, uh, but there, there's things that are so deep seated that they're still not getting the proper attention, uh, in my opinion, that they deserve. Um, and yes, racism, we're, we're opening our eyes to understand that racism has been systematic and, and deeply established in this country for hundreds of years, but we're still not fully grasping how deep it goes and how disinvested groups of people have been over generations that waking up one morning and saying, oh, racism, racism has been here, let's fix it, is not going to automatically, you know, you can't, you're not going to turn the ship on a dime. There, it, it's going to take many years of work to really restructure. And, and there's certain systems that inherently are racist and need to be completely removed or, or redone to the point where they're no longer recognizable. And that's very scary from a political standpoint because there's so many stakeholders and everyone's intertwined. So it's almost like the butterfly effect. You make one little flutter of a wings butterflies over here and you can change the entire system especially when it comes to a big overhaul. And so that's, there's a lot of pushback. There's a lot of fight from people who are comfortable in their current life ways, are afraid of what's gonna happen. And so the main challenge when developing a policy or changing a pol an existing policy is to make sure that you, do, you have the most benefit with the least amount of harm. And, and you have to weigh it, for example, on who you're trying to help the most. And a lot of time in politics, it really follows the money. Uh, so if the money is leaning one way, you tend to get policies that lean that way also because the money has more power. But it's really, again, it, to look at disinvested communities and give them a, um, a larger weight in these decisions is really important for changing around that dynamic. And uh, getting politicians in office who are willing to hear all of the stakeholders, not just the ones with the loudest voices and the biggest wallets, uh, is is paramount. It's the most important thing. Okay, great. Thank you so much for that. You definitely have a point. Um, and yeah, so can you talk a little more about um, redlining? I think a lot of people have been um, really focusing on that. We've done a few uh, articles on anthropology and issues like that that really have been disregarded. So if you could um, include any examples on redlining li or on voter fraud that you've seen because of location or maybe pollution concentrating in an area that's maybe more low income. Um, so any of our viewers could maybe focus on that or conduct research on it. Yeah, of course. Um, well, redlining, and as I'm sure you guys know, is this process of concentrating uh, people with low economic status in certain areas, or not giving them by not giving them loans uh, because of where they're they're located. And generally, that has been a very racialized practice. Um, uh, in Chicago, back in the day, they used to call it the black belt because all of the people of of that were black lived in these these areas because they weren't given loans to to do, go to different buildings. And I'm sure you can look for stories of uh, recently of, of prominent individuals who own buildings denying certain people access to their buildings because of race. <clears throat> so that's, I mean, that and that has a host of problems because if you're concentrated in a low income area, especially in California, where property taxes are so closely tied to the type of education you're going to receive, you're, you're in a disinvested area, you go to a disinvested school, you are, um, and of course, poverty and crime go hand in hand. So you're around more negative influences or people who are more desperate and do more things that they need to do to survive because they don't have economic uh, advantage or upward mobility. 
so uh, you grow up around these things, your, your likelihood of being able to go to top tier colleges, universities, get that education, you know, it, the, the, your chances are lower. And it's, of course, it's not impossible, but it, it's, un, it's, it's not equal. It's unfair. Um, it's unfair the the rates at which it's happening. It's unfair the people to it's happening to. And then of course, you know, you look at these politicians and your local representatives and where at schools they came to and the backgrounds they came from. And uh, you'd be hard pressed to find one that didn't come from a wealthy background. So what then it does is now you have people in office who are unrepresentative of people who are the most um, vulnerable. And so their voices are they 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 become invisible stakeholders holders, but some of the most important ones because they are the hardest workers of our economies. They're the ones that keep pushing things forward, making microeconomic home kitchens and selling food out of their kitchens in, in areas that have food deserts. You know, they're, they're, they're some of the, mo the most catalytic members of their community, and yet their voices are not being heard, their needs are not being met, and that's really problematic because of these types of practices that keep people um, you know, concentrated in the, these disinvested areas, and generationally so. Uh, so that it's not just, you know, for, for 10 years, but it's generation after generation uh, that people have been being, that are being disinvested. And when you, you spoke a little bit about environmental racism, and that's another really prominent thing. And um, you think about it, it's like, oh, I, you know, and here's the, the, the really simplistic argument is you're, you're the city planner and you're building out a city and you have this person who has, who's a very prominent member and he has given a lot of money to help, you know, build up the city or to create jobs and he doesn't want any pollution near his house, right? He has all this money and power, so okay, we're not going to put it there. And then there's all these people who are very mobilized and vocal and they don't want it near them, so we can't put it there. So, of course, the people who end up getting, and it's... Uh, there, it's no, there's no accident that it's again on race, race, racial lines. This is again something that's deep and systematic in our country that needs to be addressed. Um, you have people that are, you know, the the ones that are unheard. Oh well, let's just put it over here in this disinvested area because even if they wanted to make a stink, what kind of clout do they have? Um, and, and, and of course, it's not anything anyone's going to say outright, but that's, I mean, it, it, common sense. That's why these decisions are made because if they if there was enough of a backlash or a pushback, they couldn't make those kinds of decisions. So uh, again, you see this environmental racism. One of uh, an, um, one of uh, prime examples of this is that Aspen, Colorado is a very wealthy area. Well, most of Aspen is run by illegal immigrants and they're not able to live in Aspen. So what happens is they formed a community, but the community, uh, a community outside of Aspen and the community is in a floodplain, which is highly dangerous. And they, it's because they can't afford to live in Aspen, but Aspen relies on them to run the entire city, basically, or the entire area. Um, and so now they're living in this very, very dangerous area just so they can go to work and, and, and fuel this, this, uh, this one place. And so the, these are the kinds of things that we're seeing is, is that, that the structure of the built environment has created traps essentially, where it's like, okay, we're gonna, you're going to make this money. You're not going to be able to live here, but you're going to have to have longer commute times, or you're going to have to live in an area that has greater pollution in order just to make ends meet, because we don't allow people economic opportunity as much in rural areas where they could have better quality of life as far as, you know, where their house is located, so. And then, so on that note, um, how can we find an intersection between scientific research um, or social science research that incorporates everyone, everyone's situation that's just equitable? Well, it can be used in many different ways. So you could do a statistical analysis, for example, and statistical analysis is, um, is a great aspect of sociology, which is one of the social science sciences. And it's also huge in public policy. Uh, utilizes it all the time to look at, you could use statistic analysis to look at areas and see what needs are, are the most. Uh, for example, we did one on 311 service use, which 311 is is like a city services for the city of Los Angeles. You dial in 311 and I, hey, I have dead animal pickup. You know, there's roadkill or graffiti or there's a streetlight issue or, um, you know, lots of different things. Like there's water waste management. So you would call 311 if you needed these services. And what we end up found, finding when we, we looked at the utilization of the 311 service is that areas that were exceptionally wealthy didn't use it as much because 
likely they had their own private services and areas that were very uninvested or disinvested um, and poor didn't use it as much. And so you get this, the middle class using, you know, the most of these services. And what that indicates is that people who maybe need a lot of these services are not utilizing them. And, and then you would you need to go anthropologically and do ethnographic research where you went into those areas and you figured out why the service was being underutilized. Is it an aspect of trust? Um, maybe they're, they don't trust po uh, public uh, officials or people that say they're going to do these things. Maybe it brings police to their area and that's a cause for concern. Um, because there's a, a distrust between those kinds of authority figures. Maybe they don't have as much broadband access or phone access to even use or call and report these things. Or maybe they have a community that has just gotten so used to being self-sufficient that they take care of these things for themselves. So there could be all these different reasons for why a service isn't being used, but until you go in and understand the community itself, right, you're not going to know, and then you're not going to be able to improve service use or improve the quality of life of that area. We definitely don't want to leave areas without working street lights or, or um, you know, like the broken window theory goes, if there's a broken window, then it invites crime. We definitely want places to look nice and feel nice and feel safe for the people living there. Um, and so we have to know who's living there and about the people living there in order to, to do that. And that's all social science. Um, so do you think that you were able to find out about these methods uh, other than class? through trial and error, like how are you able to embrace failure um, and introduce it and welcome it? Well, I mean, the main thing about failure is, is that you never really truly fail to do something until you stop trying. Uh, and that every other misguided attempt has been a learning experience. And so every time you, you step up to the plate, and I've experienced this, especially building relationships with communities, because sometimes all you can do is say one thing wrong and you, people don't, don't trust you anymore. And that's happened. Um, and, it's, and sometimes you can't ever build it back if, it, if it's that uh, greatly you know, broken or it takes such a long time to build back. So you'd have to find other ways of connecting to that community. So maybe finding, for example, a community liaison. So finding one person within the community that trusts you enough and they can go into the community for you because that's their community and they can help. Uh, so you definitely have to find different ways around things and it's all about being flexible and being adaptive because you know, life is filled with all of these little situations where things don't go exactly the way that we plan them to. So we have to learn to roll with the punches essentially and keep working at it and keep moving forward. And it, it can be frustrating. It can be, ah, oh, pull my hair out. But at the end of the day, once you, you know, it's like going to the gym. Once you reach that, you know, that you get over the hill and you reach past that, like, I'm so tired point, you know, you get done, you feel really good about it because you've put in all that work, you've worked hard and you're seeing the results. You're seeing the results in your community. You're you're feeling very connected to to the different communities you've tried to help. Lots of positive things come out of it as long as you keep trying. So, um, what's the biggest advice you have um, for our audience that consists of mostly females going into fields that are populated by men? Oh, there's so there's so much advice. Uh, one, you I guess the most important piece of advice I was taught by a, a dear friend of mine, and she told me, set the price for your own table. Now she had this story, and it's this woman or the, sorry, this man walks into a antique store and he sees this beautiful mahogany table. It's a little scuffed, maybe a little bit worn and old, but just beautiful engraving and woodwork. And it's just lovely. And he goes to the shop owner and he says, how much is that table? And she said, uh, about $80,000. And he's like, 80,000? Oh, well, that's too much. I don't think this table is worth 80,000. She looks at it again and she goes, you know what? You're right, 200,000. He ends up buying the table. And the moral of the story is, is that you know your own value. Set the price for your own table. Don't let anyone or anything make you feel too intimidated to try. Uh, one of the, the major things that women go through is when we're applying for, for jobs or we're, we're investigating careers, we see all these things and we're like, oh, I might not be able to do that. I might not be able to do this. For It's interestingly enough to know, for men, they only have to meet about 50% of the qualifications before they're like, yeah, I can do that. Women, we have to meet 80 in our minds. 
not in real life, but in our minds, we often don't let ourselves apply to something unless we're at least 80% sure that we're qualified for it. But that doesn't give us credit for what we can learn and our capacity for learning. And so I definitely, my, my major piece of advice is don't sell yourself short and don't let anyone else sell you short either because you are capable, you are strong. And, you know, and we need, we need more women out there doing this kind of work. Yeah, thank you so much. I feel like that's very relevant to our organization, especially because, you know, we're trying to help women build their confidence and build um, their self-esteem in um, going into STEM fields and stuff like that. So thank you so much for letting us interview you. Again, you definitely mm -hmm. help provide like a lot of insight and knowledge on the fields of anthropology and shed light on uh, political analytics and mental health. And, you know, I never knew there was so much diversity in anthropology. So thank you so much. Um, and yeah, best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you, you guys as well. I think what you're doing here is amazing and I'm honored that I could be a part of it. <laughs>